All right, welcome one and all to the Cosmic Comic Nation, powered by Comic-Con Radio. I'm your host, Tom Torme, and my next guest is a former bodyguard, club owner, zookeeper, and professional wrestler, now a actor, making it on the big screen and small screen. You may have seen him acting alongside Jason Momoa in Aquaman, Kat Dennings in Two Broke Girls, and uh, as Bam Bam Bigelow on Young Rock. And it is my honor to welcome the extremely versatile and talented Patrick Cox to the Cosmic Comic Nation. Patrick, thank you for being here today. It's an honor to speak to you. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. I mean, uh, you have uh, such an eclectic resume. Zookeeper. You know, the first person I talked to, I've had the pleasure of speaking with a lot of people from kind of the comic culture, nerd culture world, and uh, uh, I've been following your account for some time. And, but you are you are the first person I've spoken to that is such a, a you're you're a talented actor, uh, professional wrestler. But you're the first person that lists a zookeeper on their resume, and and, and I'm curious how, how do you go from club owner zookeeper? Well, first of all, those two things alone generally are not spoken in the same sentence. You usually don't have a club owner or zookeeper, although I'm sure on some Saturday nights you probably need the same skills to pull both off. Uh, how, how do you go from those uh, eclectic things to now uh, in, in Memphis to to making your way to uh, to LA and, and Hollywood. Well, I get uh, I get bored easily, <laughs> and uh, I also get excited very easily. Um, there's there's not much that I get interested in that I don't go just full bore into. Um, whether it's animals or comics or movies or music or whatever, like I have to have it all. I have to do it all. I have to experience it all. Um, the club thing, the club just closed. <laughs> okay. I, well. It just, you know, we got messed with by the cops a million times and we're getting fined and I just couldn't afford it anymore. So I shut it down and um, I was actually doing overnight security at a warehouse, just sit on my butt from 9 PM to 6 AM every day. And um, you know, a, a friend of mine that works at the zoo knew that I knew my stuff. Yeah, you know, I didn't have a degree in it or anything, and, and right. got me an interview. Um, and I ended up, I would work from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., drive to the zoo, sleep in my car until, I'd get there about 7, sleep in my car till 9, get up and work a full day at the zoo. Um, and ulti- ultimately, that's why I ended up not staying at the zoo, like forever. I loved it. Right. But, it wasn't paying enough for me to pay my bills and I was just killing myself. But the, uh, the year or so I was there, it was the Memphis zoo, which is believe it or not, one of the finest zoos anywhere in the world. Um, my, my time there was incredible and fun and educational and, uh, very rewarding. I I, I honestly miss working at the zoo. (laughs) Well, I I know you, you you identify yourself as a snake guy, uh, is that something that started there, or something that had uh, that led you to, into uh, into working at the Memphis Zoo? No, most of the most of the people that worked at the zoo that were my age, we were all pet store kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We worked at pet stores, or or met there because we would just go there, like uh, Jay and Silent Bob go to the convenience store. That was us at pet stores, right? Um, you know, fish, spiders, snakes, you know, anything. Like we were obsessed with it to the point we're learning the Latin, you know, we're, we're learning the husbandry and the breeding. And so, you know, we knew our stuff, you know, before we even went to the zoo. Um, uh, but it's definitely, I actually tried to get my job back there at some point, but once you quit, they do not want you back. It's like a rule. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I, I was always into snakes. I wasn't allowed to have them. Yeah. Yeah. I would occasionally find like a rat snake and keep it in a, in a box under my bed uh, and hope my mom didn't find it. But uh, for the most part, we were a strictly a cat family. So uh, it wasn't until I was, you know, a little bit older, you know, 17 or 18, I was finally able to keep snakes. And, and I ended up with like a hundred. I'm not exaggerating. It was, it was absurd. I mean, I, that, that, uh, that is a hundred snakes. It, it how, that's unbelievable. I mean, how, how do you, how do you manage uh, how do you manage so many? I that's they track systems, and you you just stack cages. Oof. Some of them were pairs that I kept together, and um, I had um, 
let's see, I had about a six foot jungle carpet python that just lived in my house that would just go free and enjoy its life. And, oh, hey, you're in the kitchen today, Nate. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and and, and at, at what point, uh, 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 so you, you're now uh, a man mountain in Memphis, just a, a, a giant man, always, always with the shaved head, or uh, at this I point, would, are we talking about a, a, a shaved head, large man walking around the streets of Memphis with hundreds of snakes? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's gotta be. I went from very, very, very long hair. Oh, to, nice. I, I'm a man of extremes. I went from very long hair to shaved head overnight. Um. But yeah, I, uh, I I spent a lot of anytime I was fired or quit or needed a job, I could always find one being a bouncer. So that, right. <laughs> that was like yeah. I, I faked my birth certificate when I was 16 and got my first job uh, bouncing at a, at a uh, uh, let's see, we're in 2023, so I have to be careful how I word everything. Uh, an adult uh, beverage and dance entertainment facility. Oh, I guess. Oh, okay. So I was Sixteen to pull that off. <laughs> I tell, I tell you that 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 story will go for Cosmic Comic Nation after dark. Well, go that will save that, that for the spinoff, the adult show, the uh, right. the R extra, the NC seventeen rated version, because I'm sure that in itself. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I cut off. I'm sorry. I said, tune in later for the rest of the interview. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, CCN after dark. Who? <laughs> uh, and, and so you're you're bouncing. You're controlling a. I assume an army of snakes that you're. I assume trying to program for uh, world domination. You're working at the zoo. Uh, how how about your professional wrestling is on your resume? How in the world did you get involved in uh, the squared circle? Well, I was uh, always a fan. I mean, Memphis is, I don't care what anyone says, Memphis is, was the mm -hmm. hub of professional wrestling. Anyone who was anyone in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, they all spent time in Memphis for USWA or CWA or, you know, whatever, Power Pro, whatever they were at the time. Right. Um, so, you know, I grew up Saturday morning wrestling, Jerry Lawler, Jeff Jarrett, Bill Dundee, you know, and whoever the guys were that were coming through. Um, and um, so I loved wrestling. And they had this uh, this company called KAW, Kick-Ass Wrestling. And it was super hardcore. The fans were allowed to bring things. So we had one guy that would always come with, he had, he had shoved a bat up a Chucky doll's butt and wrapped it in barbed wire. Makes sense. From a car plant that would bring bumpers and like car parts. And we, they'd throw them in the ring, and we'd beat each other with it. And um, and so I started going to that just because it was fun. And you know, I'm, I'm hanging around afterward because Tommy Rich was there when he was still with the Full Blooded Italians, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to see if I could get Tommy Rich's autograph. And this uh, mullet-headed, stocky, you know, redneck uh, Motley Cruz walked up to me, and he goes, "Hey." boy, come here. I walked over and he's like, God damn you big. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, all right, come to my school. And he, he was, he told me it would cost a thousand dollars and he'd train me. And then he found that I worked at a pet store and I traded him a boa constrictor and two ferrets. <laughs> Fair deal. I'm the only person in history that has traded ferrets for wrestling. Right. I'm fairly certain. And uh, he put me through the ringer, and it was like one of the last really old school mm -hmm. wrestling gyms. Um, it was a boxing ring, which I don't know if you know the difference. A boxing ring is uh, steel reinforced instead of plywood. So it, it's like you're hitting the concrete. It was really broke my rib first day. Um, it was an old bank in a really bad part of town. It had no heat, no air. I don't know if you're familiar with how bad the weather gets in Memphis. It had no plumbing. So if you had to poop, you had to bring your own garbage bag. Uh, it was Make, well, it makes sense. Yeah, you know, just uh, perfect. I, I tend to bring my own garbage bag with me just in case. Uh, it was caveman, and uh, but it was probably one of the best times of my life. Yeah. Was getting the crap beat out of me every day. And, you know, he told me straight up, he's like, my job is to make you quit. I will right. make 
quit. And he tried every day to make me quit. Um, and it was, uh, it was, that, that was a lot of fun. And then I just ended up doing, you know, mostly regional stuff and then skipping ahead a little bit. I got, uh, when I, after I started acting, I did a movie with John Cena and me and him hit it off really well. He was such a great dude. And I got a phone call the next day and it was John. I didn't believe it at first. I thought it was someone messing with me. Cause he was like, I want you to audition for the WWE. I think you'd be really great because we beat the crap out of each other. I mean, it was, it, it, we didn't play on this. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, he got me an audition and I completely shit the bed during the audition. <laughs> I mean, just imagine you go there and he's like, oh, you're just going to have to show him you can bump, do a little talking on the mic, show him your personality. You won't have to wrestle. And I get there and I look around and ringside. I mean, pretty much every legendary wrestler you can imagine is standing there like this, staring at me. Mm. And the one that I focused on was Arn Anderson with his nerdy glasses on and his old man dad clothes. And he was just staring at me like, you don't belong in my ring. I can't wait to watch you fail. And I just, I remember I rolled out of the ring. It was, it was one of the most embarrassing days of my life. I wore a suit because it's an interview. Mm-hmm. I ran into Vince McMahon in my suit. He gave me one of these, you know, and then I get in there and I'm wrestling and we, we called an opening spot and the guy completely whiffed and didn't do it. And my mind immediately went crazy. I blanked. I said, I'm sorry for wasting your time, sir, to, to Arn Anderson. Cause you call Arn Anderson, sir. I don't care how big you are. Ask Sid Vicious. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Sid's a good dude, though, for real. Um, wow. I said, Sid's a good dude, though, for real. But uh, wow, cool. I rolled out of the ring, went straight to the dressing room, grabbed my suit, did not even change, fled the FedEx Forum in Memphis, and these two kids outside thought I was somebody. Mm-hmm. And my autograph. <laughs> it, was, it was just like salt in the wound. Um, so as far as wrestling goes, that was the, that was the, the, the ultimate achievement was... I at least auditioned for the big show, you know? Right. I mean, you seem just physically uh, like a, a Vince's dream. Uh, he, he loves the big man. He loves that kind of uh, – he loves the, that style. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say – I'm sorry to hear that it didn't go uh, the way you wanted it to. But- well, no, the thing is, I'll, you know, I found out later – because they did – they called back months later and wanted me for one of their – one of their early – reality shows um you know at the time i was in my early 30s mm-hmm. wanted someone older that wanted to have their second chance and they wanted to put me on this show but i found out that they don't really pay you very much in the wwe until you make it until you're big time and i was already acting at that point and i was like i just made 12 grand to do one day day's work on a commercial i think i'm gonna you know what's left of my hips and knees i'm gonna save that right right <laughs> Twelve grand, you say, for a day's work, hey? Oh. Yeah, schools, you know, on a commercial. It was a, it was a, it ended up being a national commercial that ran for a little bit, and you know. Uh-huh. But I was like, if I can make that kind of money, not uh-huh. break myself in half, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose that. Yeah, good call, good call. It's good not to, you don't have to break your ribs uh, on a commercial on a day set, right? Uh, so, uh, and, like, and, rock, and then, then yes, you do. <laughs> Well, I, I, I can tell you, I, I, I didn't catch that national commercial, but I did, I was first introduced to you, uh, and I do believe, you know, I, I tell people this, and I remember watching uh, uh, the movie for the first time. I first saw you on the big screen in Aquaman uh, playing a character called Keeble, and you... That's where Jason Momoa wore lifts, because when I first met him, he runs up to me outside in Australia wearing only a towel every woman's dream and he hugs me and he was a little bit shorter than me and then suddenly on set he's <laughs> on me so i still to this day right sorry jason if you happen to see this i know you wear lifts and, and jason if you happen to see this i love you i personally i i, I would leave uh i'm a happily married man of 30 years but she would understand i'd, I'd leave right now for you i believe uh i <laughs> I walked in the other day and I saw uh, uh, colleagues of mine watching a video of him dance around in a towel. So uh, I think most people would understand. But you totally, I, I, and, and not to discredit you, Jason, if you are watching this, uh, but you totally stole the show in that scene. 
you rocked it, calling him Fish Boy. Uh, you came across so menacing and, and then switched to this kind of lovable guy. And that scene really, I mean, I, I thought the movie was solid in and of itself. I'm a big supporter of uh, the movie. I think it, it rocked. Uh, and I'm, I'm always ready to argue its merits with people. But that particular scene was a true standout. Uh, how, how did you get involved in the Aquaman film? Well, actually, it's funny, James. I got I got the audition just like like any audition. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, I you know honestly it was a point where I thought my life was about to be amazing because I just did uh, four straight weeks in Fiji at a resort. I think I worked four days in that entire four weeks. It was just heaven on earth. And then I get back, and within five days, I booked Aquaman, and I'm off to Australia. I was like, this is going to be my life from now on. And then, you know, it was like five years till I booked at the country job. But um, I, I, it's funny because J James told me this. Um, I did the audition normally. And then they, they didn't turn off the camera quick enough. So at the end of the audition, I laughed and I was like, <laughs> did I mess that up? I'm so sorry. And James said that he saw that and he was like, that's what I want. That guy. Right. It was almost an accident that he saw it. Um, and that scene was so fun because what you don't see, and I don't think it's on any of the DVD stuff, is every my I felt like my job was to try to make Jason lose it every every take. So every time we were about to do the, the selfie, I would I would throw another line at him and he would crack up. And so at one point, James comes over to me because I think he was maybe getting a little a little tired of it. <laughs> he wa he wanted his take, and he comes over to me and he goes, "Hey, that's really funny. Can can you just give me one the way it's scripted?" And I was like, "I'm so sorry. You're James Wan, and I'm just some idiot that's on a weekly scale. Um, I, I'm sorry." So I get up there and I do the scene normally, and Jason doesn't say anything. He keeps looking down at me, and all of a sudden I hear. What's wrong with you? Oh, why aren't you being funny? And they he called cut, and I was like, uh, James called cut, and, and I go, James told me not to do anything this time. And Jason goes over to him and he says something. Uh, I can't hear what they're saying, and then suddenly James goes, Okay, Patrick, do it, do it the way you want. <laughs> Vindication. That was, yeah, that was kind of funny. But what ended up in the movie was the way James scripted it. Okay. There's like 50 takes of Jason cracking up that I wish I had on tape. And then, of course, the end, like, you know, the, the trash in the bar thing, that was Jason's idea. And it just, it was so much fun. I mean, it, it, it looked, it came across on screen like you guys had a blast. Uh, and it's good to hear that, it, in reality, you were having a blast. Oh, dude, he, he was, it was like, I told him I wanted to hate him so bad. Because anyone that's that like sexy and ripped and all this kind of, like I want to hate that guy. I, I get that I get that kind of hate all the time. People I, are like, oh, you're too sexy. Oh, you're too ripped. I'm like, please sex stop. Tape. Yeah, your sex tape. I know. Uh, but thank you. Sorry. You know, I, I I like to mess with people. You know, like the like the first time I met John Cena, we were running late, and we had to rush right into the scene, and he's supposed to throw a punch. And I sold it really well. And and he had caught me just a little bit. And it didn't hurt. Just a little bit. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I got right up in his face. And I was like, you stiff prick. <laughs> and I stare at him for a second. And then I wink. And he just laughed. And we, we ended up being totally cool. You know, I any big celebrity, I always take their temperature right at the beginning. And the first thing, like, Jason was like, how you doing, man? And I was like. I was like, I was doing, I was doing pretty good earlier, and then I started thinking about how you completely fucked up Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> so now I'm kind of pissed. Yeah. He, was, yeah. And he shook his head, like, a, like, like he just got in trouble at school, and he was like, "Man, I needed the money. I couldn't turn that job down." He's like, "I, I have read those books my whole life." And I was like, "You read the books?" It's like, God, man, I love you. You're so <laughs> great. And we just talked about like. Like like sci-fi and comic books and stuff, and then at one point he pulls me aside. He's like, "Hey, you can't tell anyone this, but I just booked the crow. I'm so excited." Which he ended up, you know, not doing. Mm -hmm. But he was he was so excited. You know, it was it was like hanging out with a with a little kid that was really into the same stuff I was, and um, you know, just yeah. just 
just a great guy. I, I yeah. have bad to say about him. That that that's great to hear because really, I sometimes uh, when when you hear about scenes that are like the ones that we're talking about, this great fun scene, we'd hear about actors like Jason Momoa and John Cena, and to hear that they are as cool behind the scenes as they are on the screen, and, and hearing it from someone such as yourself, uh, it it means quite a bit as a fan, you know, that to, to know that they are. You know, who, who we think they are. I don't think people realize just how cool John is, though. Mm-hmm. Um, like, every town they go to, he he gives, you know, a kid at a local hospital, like, the greatest day of their life. Um, you know, we were talking at the table at lunch, and uh, and he was like, hey, there's this... We were, we were shooting in a sort of an impoverished section of Baton Rouge, uh, was it Baton Rouge or Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. And he's like, there's this group of kids around the corner. They've been waiting for me. I was going to go say something to him. I was like, he was like, would, would you be embarrassed? Like, would you come around and, and talk some trash and let me kind of beat you up in front of the kids? Like, give them a little show? And I was like, dude, absolutely. So I come around the corner and I'm like, you know, just running off at the mouth, which is probably when he decided that I deserved a shot at the WWE. I was healing it up. And he just whooped my butt and had, you know, somebody came and helped me up and stumbling back you know the set and you know those kids were going nuts he didn't have to do that he didn't even have to walk by those kids you know and he was this this guy had full-blown flu i mean he was sick as a dog Mm. he was going he was he was doing wwe tv and then immediately getting on a plane flying to louisiana shooting and then getting on an airplane to go back and do another house show or something and then flying back to shoot the movie. And he's just his dedication and his, his attitude. Um, man, he's, he's one of the best. Like I will fight someone that has something bad to say about John Cena. He's one, no, of, I, the, one of the best dudes you'll ever meet. And I really hope to God that I get to be on a uh, peacemaker just so I can work with him again. I, I hear the same. I hear I hear excellent things about John Cena behind the scenes. That uh, he is as amiable and uh, uh, caring. I mean, I think he set a record uh, for. Most, I'm sorry. Most make a wish. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, if you're doing that, I mean, that just speaks volumes about his character. Yeah, and and he's very humble. Believe it or not, um, he's one of the strongest dudes I've ever been around. Like. I'm strong. At the time, I I had just benched 600 pounds. And I thought John was strong. And one of the extras on set, it was sort of an awkward moment at first because me and John are sitting there cutting up. And this dude just pipes in. He's like, to me, he's like, you know, I bet you think you're real tough. You know, I bet you wouldn't mess with John. John didn't even hesitate. He turns to me. He's like, are you kidding? Look at this guy. He's head and shoulders bigger than me. He's got 100 pounds on him. This guy would kill me. And then we just went on with like he was just that humble. He was like, "I'm going to shut this down right now," and he was he was he was so humble and so so cool. And he's he's all about the kids and you know. I mean, I, I sound like I'm I'm trying to date him, but he's he's really really a great dude. You got you got me thinking about this stuff, so I had to throw that in there. No, no, I and listen, he, he, I'm sure he'd be a lovely date to be on. I'm sure he would be very kind, of, very nurturing. Uh, very- uh, now you're talking about you're talking about behind the scenes and and, and John even like you know I I've heard ter- amazing things about his strength as well but I mean you're you're no slouch either you know as you said you're benching 600 at the time uh, you're a big man a powerhouse you you've appeared on the small screen and the big screen uh, oftentimes in that kind of uh, the, the menacing role uh, but are are you uh, uh, do you get a chance to show that that kind side the kind of side that we're seeing right now the kind of do you get a chance to show that on screen as well well honestly that's a lot a lot of especially early on that was kind of my bread and butter was they would want a big guy that could also be very very kind and 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 sweet and flip that switch and i seem to be able to do that like (laughs) people like us um but you know playing big mary on two broke girls you know a, (laughs) a big silly you know, gay pastry chef or, um, you know, uh, there were a few other smaller roles like that. Um, but honestly, that's why I was so excited about Bam Bam Bigelow 
was re I read the script and I, and I knew Bam Bam and they nailed his personality so perfectly. And I got to play that and I played it too well because I, I was like, I need to be Bam Bam was six, five, six, four, something like that, 400 pounds. I got to be that big. And I ate myself into mm -hmm. almost 400 pounds. And one of the most humbling experiences on earth is seeing a profile shot of yourself in spandex when you weigh 400 pounds on TV. I was so fat. So fat. Well, I, 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 so I, I, uh, pre pandemic, I was about 420 pounds. I shed down to wow, 230, really? uh, 230. Yeah. Well, I, I had to medical reasons, uh, but I was able to do it. It was, it was a pain in the ass. I'll tell you, uh, I, I've it's seen photos easy. of you. Uh, no, no, it's not easy. I, I, I saw recent pictures of you on uh, on Instagram, and you have uh, you, you're you're back to a fighting weight. You're trimmed down big time. How, how did you do that? How uh, man, part of it. I, I've I've been trying different things. I went mm -hmm. vegan for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did. I've tried keto, um, but ultimately, uh, intermittent fasting and and just being a little careful what I eat. You know, I have, to, I have my, my goal. My rule now is if I get on the scale and I've lost 10 pounds, then I get to have pizza or nachos or whatever it is I'm jonesing for. But the rest of the time I try to keep it, keep it small, you know, fruit and vegetables and chicken, you know, boiled chicken, right. real exciting stuff like that. I still have a bunch of weight I'd, I'd like to lose, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not, not easy, but uh, yeah, to, to, to answer your question. Yes. Um, most most of my roles are either big guy who is supposed to be scary but isn't or quirk or quirky you know like the movie i just shot you know i'm sort of a weirdo um i don't i don't get a lot of of uh scary roles i never get asked to do horror movies and i honestly think it's because i have a baby face mm. which I, I grew the beard for wrestling because i looked like a 300 pound toddler when I was in the ring and nobody bought me as a heel. Cause I was just, I look like baby Huey. <laughs> but I mean, but, but I mean, listen, I'd be remiss. I have to travel back for one second because, uh, my brother-in-law, my brother is a huge fan of two broke girls and uh, his name is Eon. And he was such a, a fan of your character on the show. Uh, and he had a recurring role in the show, uh, Kat Dennings and the, the whole cast must've been spectacular to work with, but, uh, yeah. And I, I, I was the longest running guest star on that show. Nobody did more uh, did more guest spots on that show than I did. I'm very proud. Uh, yeah, as, as it should be. And, and the show came, is spectacular. How, how did you end up getting involved with that? And uh, uh, how did you get to, to be that l longest uh, recurring? That's another funny story. It was supposed to be one line, co-star, one episode. And... I went to the audition and I did the voice, which I don't think you can legally do anymore as a heterosexual. I don't think I would ever get the chance to play that character again. Um, but I did the voice and, and the casting director, Julie Ashton was cracking up during the entire take. Like we didn't get a clean take because she was laughing. I felt pretty good about it. And I went in, when I booked it, I went in to do the show. And the first thing that happens is the PA walks up to me and he goes, hey, good to, good to have you here. Just so you know, you're going to go through the table read, but it looks like your scene's going to get cut. You're still going to get paid, but you're not going to be on the show. This is going to be your only day. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to meet Garrett Morris. And that's pretty cool. So I'm going to, you know, I'm a big SNL guy from way back. So I'm like, I'm going to meet Garrett Morris and I'll, it's been a good day and I get paid. So I go up there and everyone's looking at me like, you know, I'm wearing this black sleeveless shirt and camo pants and just looking like, you know, the, the warthog from hell from what was that movie? I don't know. Anyway. Um, and uh, and it comes down to my line. And I swear every eye, every head in the, at the table read just when it when they saw that my line was coming up and I delivered it and everyone in the room, everyone laughed for like a solid two minutes and then we went on 
And then afterward, he's like, hey, they decided you are going to be on the show. We've added a few lines. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's great. I can't wait to work with everybody. And then they were like, hey, do you want to come back next week? Do you want to come back next week? And <laughs> it ended up being two seasons of like some of the most, most, most fun I've ever had working. Just the best people, you know, right. Jen Coolidge, Beth Bears, and Pat, and, and Garrett, and everybody it was just so amazing to work with. Genuinely kind people. Um, just an absolute blast. And luckily, because I, I had a huge gay following before I even came to California. I got accidentally discovered on Facebook and became like a bear icon. <laughs> like I had when I was on Facebook, I had about 35,000 followers and 99% of them were gay men. Wow. And always so supportive yeah, yeah. of me. And I honestly felt like when I got the part, like, um, this is for them. This is for you guys. And most everybody was really positive about it. I got a couple of really scary, like death threat sort of messages from people that, that were not, did not think it was cool that I did the job. Um, but you know, the showrunner was gay. The you know the writers, about half of them were gay, and they chose me. So I, you know, um, I know we live in a different world now. But I'm I'm really glad I got to do the job. No, I and I, I could see uh, the appreciation for the character, and I could see the fan base. And I'm glad to hear that so many people were supportive of the role. The thing I thought that they, they most the, the the thing I heard the most was they were so happy to have someone on TV playing a gay character that looked like them, mm -hmm. you know, that was, you know, didn't have a six pack, you know, wasn't like runway model, pretty, like just looked like a big dude that you'd see at a football game like they are. And they were, they were for the most part, really, really supportive and appreciative of the character. And I was so bummed because we, we actually shot a gay kiss. I'm sorry. I shouldn't even call it a gay kiss. I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying it. Uh, uh, and all a, a, a male, male kiss. <laughs> Well, no, no, but I, I could see why you're making the distinction, though. Right. I get, I, I, as someone who's heterosexual, you're trying to make the distinction. I get, I, I, I see your point. Uh, they never aired it. They never aired it. I was very bummed for that because I was like, they're going to be so excited when they see me kissing a dude. And, right. So, do, do you know why you ended up on the cutting room floor? I mean, I could, I could guess. I remember right. the night I, I, I messaged Kat, and she was, she was so mad that they cut it. Huh. Yeah, and then I actually. I did a podcast with the guy that I kissed. He, uh, he had a podcast for a while and, uh, he, he brought me on to discuss that and everything. And he was, he was probably three inches taller than me. This he's like an MMA fighter. And it was just, it was, it was, it was pretty funny. Yeah. But, uh, uh I mean, and you, you've had a chance to work across, uh, some extremely talented people on some, uh, major productions, whether it's on small screen, uh, being a part of two broke girls, general hospital as well where you had a recurring character on the show as well with General Hospital, right? Yeah. Um, I had a recurring on General Hospital, and I did one episode of Young and the Restless. And what's great about that was every day after school, I would come home, and my grandmother would have taped two shows, General Hospital and Young and the Restless. Uh, and sadly, she never got to see me on them. But, uh. you know, like, I took the Young and the Restless job, which paid nothing, hardly, um, it, just for her. And then uh, sweet. Yeah, and then I got the general hospital one, and I was like, oh, my God. And I felt so old because when I went in for the audition, there's all these young producers staring at me, and I started singing All I Need by Jack Wagner. I was like, this is how much I love general hospital, and I started singing All I Need, and they just looked at me like – and I was like, Jack Wagner, he's, like, on the show for 25 years. Yeah. Okay, I'm an idiot. I, I will I will leave now. Right. <laughs> um, you got that, was, that was fun. It was, it was interesting to do – uh, to do soap operas to find because that world is so different. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, are there? Uh, I mean, I know you've, you've done you've done a lot of big screen adventures too. I mean, you're, uh, you you've had your thumbs broken by Catwoman in yep. in, in the Dark Knight Rises. So you, you've you've been in General Hospital, uh, which is a, a different kind of small screen adventure, right? Because I'm sure there are uh, it, it, the acting uh, the acting. Uh, skills i guess you need for general hospital are going to vary quite differently from what you're going to need for a, a big screen so w when uh, I, I i may be off chronologically which came first or either general hospital or the dark knight rises but so uh, when you 
what what was that experience like and, and really like how does that compare to being uh, on a show like two broke girls which is uh uh on the small screen versus something that you're going to do on the big screen well the dark night was first of all you know some people you know decided to be rude and you know tell me like you were hardly in that movie and i was like yeah but i grew up a batman fan i was in a batman movie you right were, yeah so i'll i'll, I'll I, take hardly in versus not in at all right yeah. so i you know you get to hang out with Anne hathaway and 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 christopher nolan and watching him work mm -hmm. such an incredible guy to, to watch do his thing um he, he didn't even have a director's chair. Like he was right by the camera the entire time. Um, that stunt, Anne wanted to do it herself, no stunt person. And she had to fit her feet through this, this angled wire that was about that big and it was not going well at, for a long time. And the patience that he showed was remarkable. And her too, by the way, um, at one point, I was in uh, a prison cell the entire time with a large man who apparently was on parole. And, and at one point, he tried to give her acting advice. And I was and, like, oh, I was like, uh -huh. oh, shit, I'm about to get a new cellmate. And she just couldn't have been nicer. She listened to him and she, she, she's like, I'm going to take that into consideration and walked away. You know, wow. like, would have been like, can you get this idiot off the set, please? How dare he talk to me? Um, one, oh, one day I turned a corner and Gary Oldman is walking towards me. And to me, he's probably number two, of like greatest actors of the, of this generation. And, uh, and I, I did what I always do. And I messed with him and he's looking at me and I nod my head at him and I was like, boring, Sydney boring <laughs> and i was like let's see let's see what gary oldman has to do with that with the you know the sid and nancy thing and he just laughed he howled laughing and then just walked past me and patted me on the shoulder didn't say a word just walked on by <laughs> i'll take it any yeah, interaction with gary oldman has got to be a good one the, the my favorite part about the batman thing was uh the the pyramid of donuts like the craft services was ridiculous they had a pyramid of donuts that was easily three feet taller than me just packed with donuts. I don't know if anyone ate them because actors don't typically eat donuts, but there was a lot of donuts. I've never seen that many donuts in my life. I, I would have liked to have seen a, a behind the scenes of Anne Hathaway just attacking this tower of donuts. Uh, it must have been a, would have been a beautiful oh, I, scene. I doubt, I, yeah, yeah, but. I'm uh, guessing he hasn't had a donut since the Princess Diaries, but that's mm -hmm. yes. That's probably, it's a good guess. It's a good guess. She would not have gotten to that outfit if she had made her and, way to that craft table. And I, if I have my timeline right, I think it wasn't too long after that that she won the Oscar. And I think she probably owes uh, a, a little a, a prison extra. She uh, does? For a new car. I mean, yeah. I probably took his advice and that's why she got the Oscar. Well, you're, you're, the, you're the only one who maybe overheard that advice. So that'd be great if that's what that little bit of acting practices what put it over the edge and got of that oscar knob absolutely yeah. i was i was really excited because i saw myself in the uh, in the trailer i was like holy crap i made the trailer and like my screen was good enough they didn't like overdub it with that same screen you hear in every movie um, uh, no wilhelm scream for you oh here's here's a here's a, a very interesting story um the night that it premiered i was actually shooting something with Oh my God! What's that guy's name that does all the roasts? Oh, uh, Jeff. Jeff. Oh my God! Is that who you think of the bull Jeff, guy? Uh, Jeff Ross. Jeff Ross. Jeff Ross. Jeez. We're doing it. We're doing an episode of The Burn, and it was the night that it came out. And that day, I'm a nerd. I play to this day uh, a game called Dark and Shattered Lands, which is a text-based mud. No graphics, you're typing, kill, name of character, kill, fight, you know, like it's, it's hundreds of nerds and you don't know nerds until you've been to a, to a DSL convention. Like Comic-Con is jocks compared to what you will see, like <laughs> for real. And they were all really excited that I was in Batman, obviously. And the con that year was taking place that weekend and it was in uh, Aurora, Colorado. 
or, or it was in Breckenridge, maybe. I, I don't remember where exactly it was, but it was near there. And one of the girls that went to the con worked at a movie theater. And they were like, everyone's soaked. We're going to see the movie tonight. You know, Schley's getting us all in. You know, we've got tickets. You know, if we want them, no problem. We're all going tonight. And then they all got to, after flying in, they were like, we're tired. Can we just go see the movie tomorrow? And they didn't go. And that was the time. That was the screening. That was the ab, the actual auditorium where the, the, the shooting happened. Oh, my God. And I get Every time I think about that, people that I've known for years, really good friends who were only going to see me and support me could have died if it weren't for a little bit of jet lag. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so glad they chose to stay home and rest. Uh, and they called me and told me that like while we were getting in the van to leave, shooting that, that Jeff Ross show. And I was like, oh, my God, thank God that you guys. Yeah. Um, that ter- that just it still gives me chills thinking about what could have happened. Oh yeah, I mean that was that was a nightmarish <laughs> event. <laughs> Not to bring the room down, but I thought that was maybe an interesting uh, interesting story to, to share. No, that, that's one of those definitely one of those great occasions where taking a nap was uh, a good thing. You know, I'm glad they decided to skip that screening, but uh, it's good they have such a loyal fan base and loyal support. Uh, I mean, the 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 scene was uh, remarkable. You have so many kind of standout scenes in these. Uh, Big productions, whether it's on the small screen or the big screen, uh, are, are there any particular instances that stand out so far? As like this, this has been my favorite experience so far, being a part of the Hollywood scene. Well, I'll tell you, the thing about it is, when you get a really, really small part, um, as long as it doesn't, you know, like there's sometimes if you're a waiter, you need to just say, "Would you like some more water?" and move on because. Mm-hmm. Don't try to make anything fancy out of it. But when you're when you're basically nobody at the time, you, if you you know you get those opportunities, I always tried to make the most of it. Like give it give it a little extra and see if the director is going to be cool with that. <laughs> and luckily, I've worked with some really great directors who are pretty open to uh, to letting me play. Um, I mean, it, 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 you're hard pressed to find a better experience. Than being a regular character on a on a sitcom, uh, especially a multi uh, a multi cam where you know you get the live audience, and you, you're there Monday through Friday with these people every day. And it really builds like a family vibe, um, and um, so I, I would definitely say Two Bro Girls. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as uh, I mean, as far as being an actor, probably the best thing I've ever done is play Bam Bam. Right. Well, that's, I was about to ask you about that as well, because very, uh, we you, we talked about John Cena, somebody who went from wrestling to acting, uh, unless you kept that little uh, little cameo of him. I think it was ready to rumble while he was. But uh, right. uh, yeah, so you've gone from wrestling to acting and now uh, back to wrestling and you played Bam Bam Bigelow on The Young Rock. Uh, how does how does wrestling uh, for Young Rock compare to? To actually wrestling, uh, in uh, in in in, uh, in the sports entertainment, I guess. Uh, how does how do the two compare? I hate that term, by the way. I'm not. I'm, I, I know. I'm, I, I wanted to make a distinction between. Uh, I get what you're saying. Uh, so how how does professional wrestling how how does professional wrestling compare to uh, wrestling for the young young rock? Young rock is way harder because <laughs> it in a in a wrestling match. Your average wrestling match is ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Um, the days that we shot those scenes of me in the in the flame tights wrestling, you know, Rock's dad, um, were sometimes twelve, fourteen hour days. Oof! And you know, for the stars, they were bringing out really thick padding. You know, anytime they had to do anything, not me. You see me bump. Like, I'm bumping on that ring over and over and over again. And I hadn't wrestled in 10 years. And suddenly I'm bumping again, and it hurt. And I was killing myself running the ropes and coming off the top rope and all this stuff. And, like, there were there were moments where they were, like, checking my blood oxygen. Because they were like, I don't like the way you look. Are you okay? Like, they, they were like, you know, um, which, you know, my weight at the time didn't help, I'm sure. But, um 
Mm -hmm. It was it was brutal. Like I honestly got there and I was shocked. I was like, I I'm I'm rarely ever allowed to do even the simplest stunts. Like productions just don't want to risk it. Because if I had come off the top rope weird and broke my leg, we're done. Right. <laughs> you know, that two weeks in quarantine and all that other stuff is useless because now Bam Bam's done. Um Sid, Vi Sid, Sid Vicious comes to mind when you oh, think, when he, what, yeah. Uh, watching watching his leg snap was one of the, and mm -hmm. lucky for him, he was wrestling uh, one of the most I don't give a crap guys in the history of wrestling who just kept on kicking him. <laughs> well, but uh, yeah, but yeah, it was it was it was very physically demanding. Um, if I had known it was going to be that bad, I probably wouldn't have gained the weight. Also, I got there and I saw the people that they cast and I was like, why is this very small man playing George the Animal Steel? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you don't have to be exactly as big as the character I see because it's a sitcom. I'm glad that I I gained all those sandwiches. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that was that was brutal. I mean, after that night, I was so grateful that it was Christmas because, you know, I couldn't fly back because then I'd have to do the quarantine all over again. I hardly got off my couch for two, for two, for the two weeks that we were off because I had broken myself and I, I, I went to the, to the doctor twice and uh, just head to toe was absolutely broken. Like if they had asked what, me to was back the next day, I could not have done it. Was your uh, you, you mentioned your reception on Two Broke Girls uh, being largely positive? How, how, the wrestling community is a, a fickle thing. Um, they they want to know everything about you, your personal life. They nitpick every aspect of your performance. I'm sure comparing it to archival footage. And uh, how how about your reception in the world of uh, professional wrestling? How about the 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 smart marks and all the fans? How, how do they uh, how do they take to your performance as Bam Bam? First of all, there's no such thing as a smart mark. They're all idiots. <laughs> You're all idiots. Let me tell you, you don't know shit. You think you know everything, you do yeah. not. Um, another phrase I hate. <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm, really, I'm, I'm hitting, I'm hitting all the trigger buttons with yeah, you. you. I'm, I'm yeah. extremely triggered right now. I, I'm glad that I'm on the other side of the screen right now. I'm glad I'm on the other side of the country right now. I, I just, just quickly, I have an, an insane respect for professional wrestling. Right, I did. I don't, I don't, I don't watch it anymore because I just think it's a soap opera. It's, it's, it's clown show now. It's not the same. Um, I mean, no disrespect to anyone that does it. Make your money. I'm, I'm very happy for you, but I don't care to watch it. I'm, I'm old school. Mm -hmm. I'm an Ed. I don't, you know, I don't like what the kids like. Um, but I have a great respect for the business, and so that, that's why I get irritated about stuff. It's not, you know, definitely not you. I'm just, I'm, I'm playing mostly. I, well, I just I'm just glad that I'm not in strangling distance. The reception was remarkable. I did something that no actor should ever do, and immediately started googling myself, Patrick Cox, Bam Bam, and seeing the YouTube comments and stuff like that. And they were like, "Oh man, all these none of these guys look like the guys. These guys suck." This, except for Bam Bam, whoever they got to play Bam Bam, that was awesome, man. I can't believe that. And you know, when I saw myself. I was bummed that I didn't get the missing tooth, but when I saw myself, they you know they sculpted the beard, an amazing hair and makeup department, and they covered all my tattoos and gave me his and gave me the flames. And so I walked around Australia with that on my head because I didn't want him to have to do it every day, so I would keep it on sometimes. Um, the, so the reception from the fans was outstanding. Every, to this day, now like I'll go somewhere and someone will walk up to me and be like, "Hey man, we bam bam." Yeah, he's like. It's amazing. Thank you. He was, one, he was one of my favorites. And and kids that had never heard of Bam Bam before started looking at his matches on YouTube, you know, and telling me about it. And I'm like, that's amazing. That's the best thing about the Young Rock mm -hmm. is people are, are are not just learning about super ultra famous Hulk Hogan's who, you know, Hulk couldn't wrestle to save his life, but he had a great personality, you know, and Macho Man, people like that. They're finding out about Terry Gordy and Jeff Jarrett. You know, and Bam Bam Bigelow, who the WWE Wrestling Hall of Fame has zero validity. Let me say this right now on your show. Zero validity until Bam Bam Bigelow is in there. I love Sid Vicious, 
said justice or however he's going to be put in. But if he is in before Bam Bam Bigelow, it's a joke. Mm-hmm. I love Sid, but you cannot compare his talent to Bam Bam's. You cannot compare his athleticism to Bam Bam's. I mean, even the way I, Bam Bam. I, I saw Bam Bam cartwheel a football field once. Ah. I mean, even the way he, he carried Lawrence, uh, speaking of football, I mean, the way, I think it was WrestleMania 11, the way he carried Lawrence Taylor to an entire match. So, I think it's so disrespectful from Vince. The reason that they paired Lawrence Taylor with Bam Bam Bigelow was mm-hmm. because they knew Bam Bam could carry him and make him look good. That's how much respect he had right. for Bam Bam's talent. And for him to not be in the Hall of Fame, just, I get, uh, uh, trigger number three. You got one more. I got to find you. Uh, <laughs> Um, but the best thing was his daughter, Bam Bam's daughter reached out and I, I saw the message. And I was like, Oh my God, she's going to crucify me. She's going to have, because the whole time you can ask anyone that was on the set the whole time. I was just like, I'm so excited, but I've never been nervous to do a show before because I love Bam Bam so much. And I, any, if I do anything to lessen his, his legacy or to not do this right, I'm just going to hate myself. Um, but what I loved about the script was they really showed how he was. He was a really nice guy. Um, but his, his daughter said that, you know, she, she got tears in her eyes and she was so happy about, uh, you know, the way that, that I portrayed her dad. Um, that was honestly the only validation that I need. Was that's his, pretty cool. His family was happy with it. And that's all I needed to hear. Like the whole world could think I sucked. If his family uh, was appreciative of, of my portrayal. All I need to hear. Yeah. I would imagine that's pretty nerve wracking in playing a character that's, you know, not fictional, but, and, uh, and whose, whose family and descendants are still around and, and wondering what they're thinking of your portrayal. So that's pretty damn cool that she's giving you the, the thumbs up and the seal of approval. Normally I wouldn't uh, care, but he's such a, he was such a, an unbelievable Right. worker he loved the business he had such a great personality he would always say like look i don't have an ego i'm not here to carry the belt i'm here to chase the belt he knew who he was you know he didn't need someone to put a belt on him to know that that he was great mm-hmm. and promoters knew that no matter what match he was in that match was going to be excellent are, are you t- are, are you taking that kind of bam bam philosophy and applying it to your acting where uh, you, you know you you want to be that person who helps carry the movie? I, 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 you know, like I said before with Aquaman, uh, it was a scene stealer. Uh, the scene in Dark Knight Rises, it's fantastic. Your character on Two Broke Girls, uh, all of these are standout characters. Uh, it, it seems as if that apo- that that logic that you admire and bam bam you're also applying it to your own professionalism well my job on any movie is not to please anyone but the director Mm -hmm. um i want as long as the director is happy with my performance i'm good um but i know that i'm not in most cases i mean who knows how things might come there might be a weird script that comes along for me but i'm not going to be the one kissing the pretty girl i'm not going to be the one saving the day i'm not going to be the leading man and and you know unless they do a bam bam biopic i'm not going to be i'm not going to be a leading man um i know my role when i came out here my my first agent wanted to i guess he wanted to ego check me and he was like who do you think you are and i said my exact quote was i want to be the white danny trejo i want to be the guy that works with the greatest actors and directors in the business and stands out like you know the guy like back then at least you probably a lot of people didn't know his name he's become a lot more you know famous now but you know i was like i want to be that guy i want to be right. like, hey that the guy from that thing you know i want to be okay the guy that de niro calls he's like we got to get we got to get patrick cox we got to right. get we got to get this guy you know and and you know, and that's why I was bummed I wasn't in uh, Aquaman too, because I had a lot of fun playing cue ball even for five minutes. Um, I, my 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 dream in my head was that we start Aquaman two in a trash apartment, and uh, Aquaman's been crashing on cue ball's couch, and, <laughs> and they're and they're just buddies. They're just drinking buddies. 
I, I would love that. I actually was wondering about that myself, but I, I, that's a, uh, it, it's a shame, but that, that, that would have been a pretty goddamn cool scene to see, yeah. uh, that, that they kind of continued that friendship after that scene. Uh, right. it, it seems like it would fit both characters perfectly. But that, but that's really, that's, you know, obviously I would love to be a leading man because that's, that's who gets the money. Um, but I, I'm happy anytime I can go on a set and make a make an impression on, you know, on the people who decide whether I work again later. Right. You know, well, I, James well, Wan called me and offered me a part in Malignant. And we talk almost almost daily. Like I'll say we say hi to each other pretty regularly, you know, and I don't think James is going to quit the movie business anytime soon. So I'm hoping, you know, if a big guy comes up, James is going to think. I like, and James thinks I'm funny. Mm-hmm. Like, 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 even the, my scene got cut from *Malignant* because it was funny, and it just didn't fit the tone of the movie. That's why they cut it. But like, he thinks I'm funny. I'm, I'm the big funny guy to James. <laughs> and I'm like, God bless you, James. You keep thinking that, and and remember me next time. Right. You keep um, thinking that, and you keep my number handy. All right. I just I feel like if it comes down to me and three other guys. If, if the deciding factor is we worked with Patrick before, he he went above and beyond. He was very cool with everybody. He was fun to have on set, and he did a great job. If, if all things are equal, that's the tiebreaker. That's what I go for every time. Right. So. Well, I mean, you, you, your your stories are remarkable, and it's amazing how you've made your way, and, and your hard work and your work ethic has brought you – everywhere that you've been and hopefully we'll keep bringing you uh all, all those things that you said you weren't then you're the guy that's not kissing the pretty you're, you're not the guy getting the pretty girl I, I, th- that's that may be now but that that's that doesn't speak for the future i think you've got it I, uh, no i'm not I, johnny reeves or brad pitt i know that i'm fine with it if, if it comes along i'll be the best damn romantic comedy lead you ever had right you know they'll be like tom hanks who you know i'll <laughs> Um, if that comes along, but until then, I'm I'm totally fine being who I am and being tight. That's awesome. If it pays the bills, man. Tight casting. <laughs> so uh, I, we we've seen a lot of wrestlers uh, from Roddy Piper to John Cena to Dwayne Johnson that have gone from wrestling to the big screen, and and sometimes we've seen the adverse where we've seen wrestlers getting uh, excuse me uh, actors get involved in wrestling. So I, I thought if it's okay with you to play a quick game. And I'm going to name a, a few actors, and I wanted to hear your opinion on whether or not you think they would make it in the world of professional wrestling. Okay, let me just say one thing real quickly about that. Batista is so talented; it's it's ridiculous. Right. Like when I saw him for the very first time in Guardians of the Galaxy, his timing, his delivery. The guy is so talented. Like, I haven't seen the new M. Night Shyamalan movie he did, but I can't wait to. That guy is so talented. He is, no offense to anyone else, but he is easily the most talented wrestler turned actor. He's, he's, he, could, he could be, I could see him winning some statues. I, I, maybe, maybe you haven't seen Suburban Commando with Hulk Hogan. I mean, <laughs> I saw Suburban Commando in the theater, son. Oh, oh, That's how I, I am. I apologize. Uh, whatever that movie was with him and Zeus. I, no I, holds barred. No holds, no holds barred. barred. In the theater. I was a so, WWF kid when I was. So did I. I went to a, I was, in, I was, that was like a friend's birthday party for us to go to the theater and see that. Uh, and, and, uh, we still talked to him afterwards though, but, uh, uh, not the best choice. Not the best choice. No. Uh, Hulk is not good at anything except bodybuilding. Hmm. That's his own. And talking. That, that, that's it. You know. And I, all offense intended. I don't. I don't care for him. I, you know, he, he was probably watching. Tune out at that scene. Now he's. Never... I'm, I'm sure Hulk is watching your podcast now. Just, just, just furious. Get so this just, brother. Get this guy on the phone. Get this guy out of here, brother. <laughs> Talentless. But anyway. Oh. Uh, all right. Here you go. I'm going to hit you with one, and you tell me. Uh, I'll start with uh, someone we, we talked a little bit about tonight. How do you think Jason Momoa would do in the world of professional wrestling? He would kill it because he's got. I mean, he's. I know he doesn't look like Aquaman totally every time. Like once they call cut and he he gets back to the Guinness and the, and the pizza, but uh, but he's got the build, he's got the size, he's got the personality. Um, I hate his hats. I hate those steampunk hats. He <laughs> crap so much. 
but I could definitely see him going out there, grabbing a mic and, and completely owning an entire arena full of fans, just whether as a heel or as a baby, he would absolutely kill it. And that's nice. not, not kissing his ass. That's my honest opinion. Well, I, I, I have no shame and I would gladly kiss his ass. Jason, I think you'd be great. Uh, so how about another one of your co-stars? How about Kat Dennings? How do you think she would do uh, in the squared circle? Kat's feisty. Um, but she's also very, uh, very chill, very passive. Um, so I don't think, I don't think she would do so good. I think she would be like, and also if you ever meet her in person, she has the most beautiful skin of any human being ever. I'm convinced that she just goes out. If she goes to the beach, she's under an umbrella the entire time. Mm-hmm. Like just you don't know what porcelain skin is until you meet Cat Dennings. And I don't think I don't think she would risk that skin to get in the ring and have anyone even pretend to punch her. Okay. I would step in and stop that from happening. Don't you dare. You're a national treasure, Cat Dennings. Do not mess up that beautiful skin. She she wouldn't have to make it to the ring. You would just you would be that enforcer for her. Stop yep. it. Protect. Go out and grab the mic and like throw some casual sarcasm your way. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe hurt your feelings a little bit. You know, just a little, a little casual sarcasm, and then go back mm-hmm. to the back. But I don't. She's not. She's not a super intense like freak out person. So I don't even think she'd be all that great mic skill wise. No offense to her. No, her no. actress. I don't think she'd make it in the big in the in the squared circle. All right, uh, and I know you have a rather eclectic taste in music, everything ranging from like the Misfits, Slayer to the Cure. Uh, Richard and, Mark. So, oh, Richard Marx. I'm a Marxist, buddy. Oh wow! Hold on. That that would have got you. That would have got you black uh, blacklisted in the fifties. Uh, for but wow, that's pretty. <laughs> different. Oh, different different Marx. Different Marx. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, love, love Richard Marks, Air Supply, all that shit. Country, I'm all over the place. So how, how do you think someone like, uh, I'll toss out uh, someone that maybe a lot of people not, might not remember. How, how do you think Glenn Danzig would do in wrestling? Again, I don't know if it's if I'm allowed to use the <laughs> word that people in the industry use. I think he'd be great as at little people wrestling. Mm-hmm. You know the word. You know the word. Because like I worked with a lot of small people, little people. Okay. And it's diminutive. And, and they called it midget wrestling. They called okay. it. My one of my best friends when I was training was Hollywood the midget, and he he did a thing called extreme midget wrestling in Memphis for a number of years. Um, he was very proud of it, and I'm proud of him. So I will use his his words. De- Glenn is very small. Um, he is. Uh, he's always been very muscular. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, maybe like, maybe like him versus like Rey Mysterio mm-hmm. would be cool. Like less of a high flyer, uh, more, you know, like more of like a tough guy thug versus Rey Mysterio and his high flying style. Um, Glenn could also call upon the dark powers of Satan and uh, bring it home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very. I, Nailed I, it. I, what's the guy? There's a new guy that wears the face makeup and everyone thinks this is funny. That does the whole devil thing. Uh, it, in WWE right now? I don't know. Dan Housen? Is that his name? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Dan Housen. Yes, that guy. You're right. Like, yeah, like, like him, and Dan, him and Glenn should do a tag team. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be pretty sick. I, I, I'm, I'm going to hit you with a last last one. Okay. A, a, and unfortunately, she's no longer with us. But, That's man, oh, yeah, but man, oh, man. Let's see. I wouldn't have. How do you think B. Arthur would have done in wrestling? Oh, she would have killed it. She would have killed it. Like she would have had some some really memorable matches mm-hmm. with like you know um, uh, I'm blanking on names right now. Um, not Wendy Richter, but uh, oh, oh, Mula, Fabio Smula, Mula. They would have had some great matches. Yeah, B was a B was a tough lady. She was a yeah, yeah, a strong chin, broad shoulders. Had that look in her face all the time, like don't no guff. Like that's been her name. Like B no guff Arthur. 
let's trademark that now. I think she could have taken she could have taken Mula easily with a great WrestleMania match. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of like somebody else like that's a big time actor these days that would that would be really kick ass in wrestling, but I'm sort of I'm sort of failing. I gotta tell you, you know who I think would be really good at hmm. Tom Cru Tom Cruise. He's like four foot two. Yeah, yeah, like, but man, can he? He could probably take a bump. I tell you what, he would. I don't. I don't think there's an actor that would put more of himself into it. Mm -hmm. Like he would literally. He would. He would do a scaffolding match. Right. You know. He would. He. He would go off the like. He would take the forty foot bump. He absolutely would. Ah, uh, yeah, I agree. No, I agree. There's no fear in that man whatsoever. Uh, Patrick, as, as we're winding down, I really have to know. Like, cause I, I, I know that. Uh, you're a remarkable talent, and you, well, you're. Oh, my, my pleasure, and, and thank you for being here. Uh, what, what do you have coming up? Uh, do Do you get to do? Uh, I, I know you're uh, you're acting, and you're, you're constantly busy. But do you get to do like the? Do you, do you go to cons either as an attendee or as uh, as somebody no. work? I have. Uh, I've always wanted to go to Comic Con, mm -hmm. but nowadays like all the people that used to make fun of me for liking comic books that's who goes to comic-con so <laughs> but, no i understand that completely i like, there's been a radical people, shift all these people that call themselves nerds today really need yeah. to go back to 1986 and find out what it was really like um because they don't know but um i have, I have a convention agent uh, she's uh, kind of standing by, I guess, for me to do something worthwhile. With a uh, finger on the button, ready to go? Yeah, uh, a good friend of mine, Cooper Andrews from The Walking Dead. He played Shazam's dad. Oh, okay. You know who that is? Yeah, yeah. Really great dude. And so great on Walking Dead. Just He's he's such a talent. Um, he he actually introduced me to her, and, and so I'm signed with a convention agent. So if anybody wants me at their convention... I'm very personable, and I don't mind signing autographs all day. Um, if you want the complete set, I always thought it would be great if like Momoa had done Comic Con with me, and we set up a booth where like you know we're doing the selfie, you know. That would be awesome. Yeah, you, yeah. You get to be in the selfie with me and Aquaman. Man, we would have cleaned up. I would have made a few dollars. I think at that. Damn but, right. But no, never. I've never done uh, never done a con. Um, I would love to. I would love to do something that matters enough that fans really want to do it. Like I've, I've become friends with Kane Hodder. Oh yeah. Uh, who, who, every time I talk to him, he tells me he, he wants me to kill him, uh, which I think is just great. Cause I actually, I was, I got into acting through writing. I'm okay. A writer first. And um, I wrote a, a Friday the 13th uh, spec script that I sent to him and he loved it because it, it's sort of meta and, He's playing Jason and then gets killed by Jason um, in my script. And he he let he's like, I want you to kill me. Um, but I never get I never get to do horror. Man, you you would kill it. I mean, very literally as Jason. You would be a perfect Jason Boris. I mean, I've got like like seven inches on Kane. Like, imagine me as Jason. And and I'm such a fan, like I can just mimic Kane. You know, I know all Jason's movements. I want to do it. I even I even call, I called Sean Cunningham's office and tried to pitch him my Jason script, and he was like, "I don't have the rights right now, so we can't talk about this. Do not send right. me that." But uh, yeah, I want to I want to do something in, you know, like I did the. By the way, the Orville is a fantastic sci-fi show. I did the pilot. I was the ogre in the pilot that gets his head cut off, um, and I think if you watch the first three or four episodes, you might go, eh. but it gets so good i'm a huge orvo fan huge orvo fan so good yeah. Once it, it finds its voice it's such a good show yeah and like so like between that and aquaman like i'm hoping i'm hoping to do something that fans want i i think you've already accomplished that i mean between uh your work on the tv your work in the movies i i oh, definitely think i can see you but <laughs> to tell that to the cons oh yeah but yeah, you know, to to be in something, you know, like whether it's you know Doug Bradley as Pinhead or you know or or you know Robert England as Freddy or Kane as Jason, like to do something that matters, uh, Bruce Campbell, you know that like when people see you, even though you may not be the most famous dude on the planet, 
to a certain group of people, which I belong to, you are the greatest. You just made their day. I want to do something that, that when I show up somewhere, I, somebody's having a shitty day and maybe I made it better because they met the guy that played Michael Myers or whatever. And which I, I became friends with Kane because I saw his documentary mm-hmm. and I emailed his manager and I wanted to say, Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I went through a lot of stuff like that when I was a kid and I was just incredibly inspired by his documentary. And I just, if there's any way, if you could pass that on to Kane and it was my birthday and the phone rings and I answer it and he's like, this is Patrick Cox. Yeah. Kane Hodder. Bullshit. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's how good a dude he is. Like, I just mailed his, I emailed his manager and said that he inspired me and I loved his documentary. Next thing you know, like, I've got Jason's phone number. It's like mm. literally in my phone with Jason in the hockey mask. Like, I, anytime Kane Hodder texts me, I text that, I take a screenshot and just all my friends. Guess who I'm talking to? <laughs> right. Well, we, we, ha- we have to get you into the world of horror. I- I'm a big horror fan. I go to conventions all the time. I'm headed to one in New Jersey this weekend called Monster Mania. I have a blast at those. I met Kane Hodder years ago at a Fangoria one. I still have a picture of him choking me. Uh, I Yeah, I've got a picture of him back in the early 90s choking my mother-in-law on a celebrity cruise. Um, I don't know if you like football, but like my uh, father-in-law is Bob Golick. Now he was a- played for the Raiders. Uh- Oh, you know, I, I, I was a different kind of geek growing up. I never got into sports. I can see why people love it and uh, aspire to. Right. I was, I was into all of it. But, like, yeah, but, but like, most people would see Kane walk down the street and not think much of it. But, like, someone like me that grew up just obsessed with that world, meeting him is like, you know, meeting Tom Cruise or meeting mm-hmm. Tom Brady or any of the Toms, any of the famous Toms. Um, so, you know, if, if I could, if I never get to the level where fans are screaming my name and I'm putting my, my handprints on the walk of fame or whatever, if I could, if I could just get to the level where I go to a horror convention and there's 200 people that are so stoked to get my autograph and take a picture with me, that's a pretty great career. That's, that's- right. <laughs> but that, that's admirable and, and, and very humble of you because uh, you, you definitely have the talent and you definitely have the drive to to uh, make it and to think that uh, you, you think just a handful of people. I, I guarantee you at any convention floor, horror, comic, uh, people would, would be thrilled to, to meet you and well, talk to I, you about I, your experience. I don't care if it's San Diego Comic-Con or Fort Smith, Arkansas Comic-Con. Anybody mm-hmm. want, if anybody cares enough to bring me out, and set me down with a with a with a sharpie. I'm I'm honored and would always love to do it. You know, just people. It's funny, you know, because I I think it's great. Anytime someone I meet someone, and they're like, "Oh my God, my wife loves Two Broke Girls. Will you Facetime her for me?" Like that makes my day as much as it makes. <clears throat> yeah, you know, just 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 knowing that I did something that like made someone's life better, even for two minutes. Uh, you know, that's re- that's really cool. Yeah, overwhelming feeling. It's so great. Uh, so uh, how how about in terms of uh, projects coming up? Do you have any uh, projects that you can share with us? Yeah. Um, well, I just did a small part on Young Sheldon recently. That'll be out in a few weeks. Um, the uh, probably the biggest thing is I saw that you uh, reviewed Cocaine Bear. Yeah. Which is the most fun movie since Lake Placid. It's just- oh. What a perfect have, comparison. What a perfect comparison. I had the cocaine bear hat. I had the cocaine bear shirt. I love cocaine bear. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if Betty White had, had lived, uh, yep. she would have been, just, she would have been perfect for cocaine bear. Uh, she was so good in Lake Placid. So she good. really, oh my God, she, she really was. Um, but the guy that wrote that, Jimmy Warden, who was a phenomenally talented screenwriter, um, just made his uh, directorial debut in a movie called Borderline, and it stars uh, Samara Weaving, who is his wife. Right. Just okay. Oh, really? Just a sweetheart. Um, Eric Dane from um, what's that? Uh, what's that show where all the teenagers have sex and do drugs? Oh, that could be just about anything on MTV, probably. The one on HBO with uh, Spider Man's girlfriend and. Uh, 
No, oh, yeah, I'm actually happy to say I, I don't I don't know. I I, 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 st- I stepped out of the t- teen drama world uh, uh, many gray hairs ago. I actually like the show. I was kind of forced to watch it by my wife, but it, it's, it's a really good show. But anyway, Eric Dane, um, he was on a show called The Last Ship for a while. Um, oh, sure, yeah. He's he's tremendous. Um, Ray Nicholson, who is uh, Jack Nicholson's son, oh. and un- unbelievably good. But, so between uh, Hugo Weaving's daughter and Jack Nicholson's son, you're uh, you're in with a lot of Hollywood royalty there. Exactly. Um, there were some great, told some great stories. You should try to, audit, to interview him. Um, but yeah, we did a movie uh, in Canada last summer that's phenomenal, and he was great because he's a dream to work for as an actor because he just lets you do your thing. You know, I apologized so many times if I messed up. Don't ever apologize to me. Don't ever apologize to me. You do your take, then do my take. Do your take first. Go ahead. He was so so wonderful to work with. But like in the '90s, if you recall. Um, once Pulp Fiction came out, every independent filmmaker tried to do their version of Pulp Fiction. Right. Um, my personal favorite is uh, Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. Mm-hmm. Absolutely amazing movie. But there were a lot of low-budget, like low-rent, wannabe uh, Tarantino films in the 90s that really feel like that era. And I feel like we made one of those. But elevated. It's very, it's very funny. It's very well-written. Very violent. Um, it's everything you would want in a, in a movie that came out in 1996. Okay. It's what well, 1996 is pre- pretty much where I stopped uh, evolving as a human being anyway. So that's perfect. <laughs> I think that, I think that's accurate for me as well, yeah. but it's, it's, um, it's really good. And I've seen some clips from it. It's, it, it it's going to be really good. Uh, it's the exact kind of movie that I want to see. And a lot like cocaine bear, I think people are getting really, really sick of reboots and remakes Mm -hmm. every movie has somebody with a cape on like i'm i'm sorry i just i'm over it for a while i I gotta tell you i'm sorry Uh, i'm sorry i was saying just take a little break like Mm -hmm. when we we were kids it was cool because like every three or four years you'd get a star wars movie not every three or four days right you know Um, so i could see i could see right that i definitely felt that fatigue and when i saw cocaine bear uh, it was definitely a, a nice pr- reprieve, as he said, very Lake Placid-esque. Yeah. But one of the cool things about Lake Placid and one of the great things about Cookie Bear is that you generally, uh, e- even referring to like a Kane Hodder movie, if you if you saw Friday the 13th Part 6, you, you just want Jason to t- put that kid in a sleeping bag and slam him against a tree. You, you didn't particularly point. care. Oh, yeah, that's a great kill. You, you didn't particularly care about the teenagers, but with, with Cocaine Bear, those characters were written so well yep. that any one of them could have carried the movie on their own. And if he's bringing that sensibility to the, the film you just worked on, I, I can't wait to see it. That's this movie. Um, any, any one of the characters could have, uh, could have carried it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of my first lead roles, like actually being in most of the movie. Um, but all the characters are developed really well. They're written really well. They all have unique perspective. Um, you kind of feel for them, even the bad guys, which, you know, spoiler alert, I'm a bad guy. <laughs> but you feel for me. You understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. C- because he could have just written my character as, you know, a generic villain or whatever. But he, he really gave it heart. He gave it spirit. Um, he gave it layers. And every single character in the movie has them. And I really hope he gets a, a shot to be released in theaters because... You know, if Terrifier and Megan and Cocaine Bear are teaching us anything, it's that if you put out a quality film in the theaters, people will go see it. If it's original. And you just froze, so I don't know if you can even hear me anymore. Not your back. I cannot hear you, sir. I have no idea what you're saying. (laughs) Well, I think this is a great place to end the interview, Patrick. (laughs) Are you thinking really hard or is it frozen with your finger on your lips? I I can't hear you. This is probably a really fun way to end the end the interview though. Just me riffing and you being frozen. Right now you look like Rick Steiner. I don't know what it's like the shadow it's making you look like you've got the the Rick Steiner mustache. 
Now it's gone. Now you look like Bruno Kirby again. Anyone there? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I'm going to give you to the count of five. You there? Cannot hear you, bud. All right. I'm just going to say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much for the interview. Have an awesome night. I can't wait to see the podcast. You're awesome. Keep in touch, buddy.